We have here today uh, Pablo Bandera from uh, Phoenix, Arizona, who has kindly agreed to talk to us uh, about uh, his memories of Professor René Girard and how Professor René Girard has influenced him in his work. So let me start off by asking you, uh, when did you first hear about Professor René Girard? Uh, well, I first heard of him very early on before I knew who he was, because he's a... Uh, he was a personal uh, friend and a colleague of my father's. Uh, so, um, you know, I have some vague memories of, uh, of Rene Girard coming over to our house for, for dinner and stuff uh, uh, with his wife, Martha, um, you know, when I was a young, a young boy. So I didn't know who he was at the time, of course, I had no idea. You know, I just knew he was some friend of my father's. Uh, but uh, yeah, I have, those are the earliest memories I have of Rene Girard, <laughs> not, not much use, but, uh, but they go back that far. When did you uh, encounter his, uh, his uh, theory and his thoughts? Yeah, well, of course, uh, it, was, it was really through my father that, uh, that I came to, uh, uh, to understand René Girard and the medic theory. What year was it that, uh, that you first met him when you were a kid? I don't remember. I was quite young when I, when I first met him. Uh, um, the first time I actually uh, had a conversation with him about mimetic theory, you know, a conversation uh, you know, that I could actually understand was, uh, not until probably, um, not until after graduate school, uh, uh, once I, once I started working, probably my, uh, mid twenties or so late twenties. I think the, um, the first, the first time, uh, I really started understanding, well, I wouldn't go that far. The first time I started really thinking about mimetic theory, um, was when I was reading my father's, uh, manuscript for his book, The Sacred Game. And this would be uh, <clears throat> in graduate school sometime, you know. Um, it would be in the early 90s, I guess, uh, 92-ish, something like that. Uh, yeah, 92, 93, uh, somewhere around there. Uh, that was the first time I had really uh, kind of delved into the work that my father was doing. And um, uh, yeah, just sort of out of curiosity, you know, after hearing my father talk about, uh, you know, Gerard and mimetic theory and all this stuff, I figured, you know, out of curiosity, I would try and find out more about what he was, what he was talking about. So I read his manuscript, The Sacred Game. You know, I didn't, I didn't really understand everything he was talking about, but, you know, I fully expected it to be some, uh, you know, rather dry bit of literary criticism and literary theory, you know, but I thought, well, you know, out of respect for my dad, I'll go ahead and read it just to see what he's talking about all the time. And I was kind of surprised to find that this, uh, you know, what he was writing about was was so much more, uh, you know, I mean, he was talking about history and culture and religion and, and psychology and anthropology. And, um, you know, that, that was surprising to me. And that, that, so that was kind of my first uh, little awakening uh, that, uh, you know, I don't really know what this mimetic theory stuff is, but apparently it's pretty important and uh, pretty, pretty broad and far reaching. So, so that kind of piqued my interest at first, but uh, uh, I, I would say that was kind of the, the start, the slow ball rolling, uh, you know, in, in my mind. You were doing your graduate studies in what exactly? In, uh, I got my undergraduate in theoretical physics and then uh, my graduate studies were in aerospace engineering. Wow. Which has nothing to do with mimetic theory. Right. Although not, that's not true anymore. Based on my latest book, I've managed to connect the two. Uh, <laughs> um, but otherwise, not, not, not a whole lot of uh, relevance at the time. Okay. So where did you do your graduate school? Uh, Georgia Tech. Georgia University. Tech. And your undergrad? I was at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Okay. How did you understand? How did you start understanding mimetic theory? Did you read any of René Girard's work itself? Uh, yes, I started to. Uh, there is actually a, a, a kind of a turning point uh, for me, anyway, uh, which is really when I when I really kind of got on the path to uh, to studying uh, mimetic theory seriously and understanding it, and um, it. It's a bit of a corny story, I'm afraid, but uh, but I promise it's true. <laughs> um, uh, I told this story once to somebody, and uh, I, I don't think I've shared it with too many. But uh, there was, you know, back in, in uh, when I was uh, right after graduate school. Uh, so again, still in my early 20s or so. Uh, um, this is when I was working in Buffalo, New York, just out of graduate school. Uh, I was involved with uh, with a girl at the time. And uh, there's a whole lot of drama as there tends to be in you know, young relationships. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, like most young 20 something year olds, I was, you know, torturing myself with all the, you know, the pains of the heart and, you know, uh, bemoaning my, my, my uh, problems to the stars and writing bad poetry and doing all the things that, you know, 20 some year olds do it when they're in, in the throes of some romantic crisis. And I happened to be reading uh, um, Don Quixote at the time. And I was reading, uh, I came across the, 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 the chapter in Don Quixote where, where Don Quixote explains to Sancho that he needs to go into the woods and go crazy for a few days and just go nuts as a kind of penance for his love for Dulcinea, you know, because this is what all great knights do. And uh, especially his, you know, his model Amadis de Gaulle. And uh, so this is what he was gonna do. You know, he's telling Sancho, hey, you know, just uh, here, hold my stuff. I'm gonna go into the woods and go crazy. Uh, I'll meet you back here in a few days. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, the irony of course is that he is crazy, right? I mean, you can't get any more crazy than a crazy person saying he's gonna go and act crazy for a few days as if you weren't already crazy. Uh, so I was reading this and it, it had dawned on me that this is me. This is, this is what I'm doing. This, this, I'm, I'm reading about myself here. This is absurd. What am I thinking? Uh, and it just sort of, you know, it just sort of came on me all of a sudden. And I, I called my father up and, and, uh, and said, you know, dad, you need to, uh, I think you need to explain this mimetic theory stuff to me uh, in a little more depth because I, I, think I, I think I might be starting to get it. You know, <laughs> I think I might be catching catching it, you know, kind of like COVID, you know, I think I might be testing positive for mimetic desire. I'm not sure. That was, that was really the start. That, that was the turning point for me for that, you know, that just kind of uh, made me go from just this sort of, you know, a casual, yeah, I've read a couple of my dad's things and I kind of know what it is too. No, I actually really want to understand this, you know, uh, right. and, and that has stayed with me long because that is uh, for me with uh, probably the greatest power um, of, of mimetic theory, you know, the, the kind of the intellectual power of mimetic theory is it's intuitive. Uh, the, the fact that you can really, you know, it's not an intellectual ever philosophy or idea. Um, it's understood at an, on an intuitive level. And what hit me first, you know, a kind of intuitive understanding that then led to a greater and greater intellectual understanding. And so from that point on, you know, I was, I was reading to get my hands on. And that's when it started. Which uh, which book of Rene did you read? Uh, well, I think I started with Things Hidden, if I remember correctly. Um, and I uh, can't remember which one of those came from. I think I started with Things Hidden and then probably The Scapegoat. Uh, I See Satan Falling uh, was a big one. Um, Bailey's book, Violence, and was also an eye-opener for me. So that was, that was really helpful. And then uh, uh, reading some of my dad's stuff as well and mostly conversations with my father. Um, you know, I was just very lucky to have kind of my own personal tutor in genetic theory. Sure. Uh, and, um, you know, he was, he kind of he kept my thinking along the, along the right lines, you know. Did you ever have a conversation with René Girard directly? Oh yeah, sure. And um, uh, especially, you know, af after I'd gotten involved in this and uh, started going to the cover conferences and stuff. Um, yeah, I had, uh, several conversations with Rene Girard. Uh, probably, um, well, I was uh, invited, um, you know, Bob Hammerton Kelly uh, uh, organized uh, a number of years ago, uh, this sort of a think tank uh, at Stanford, um, you know, kind of the young Girardians, you know, kind of a, the younger intellectuals involved in mimetic theory. Um, and he invited me to join that group. Um, that's where I met a number of people that are uh, you know, very actively inv involved in, in cover now, in mimetic theory now. Um, and Rene Girard participated in that. So that was a good, good opportunity for, for all of us to, to talk with Rene Girard and, you know, for over the course of several days. But probably my fondest memory would be when my father and I went to visit him uh, at Stanford, at his house in Stanford, and just stayed with him for, uh, for a couple of days. Uh, that, that was really nice because that was really just me and my father and Rene Girard uh, and Martha Girard, um, just just sitting at his house, you know, with a with a bottle of wine and and books and just just talking about stuff, and that that was that was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. So, tell me about your book. How how in the world did, uh, did the mimetic theory apply to physics? Yeah, it's kind of surprising. Um, that came about <clears throat> uh, almost by accident. 
that um, I was reading about uh, you know some article uh, in uh, about uh, quantum theory. You know, one of the many many articles written about quantum theory and kind of its relationship to uh, philosophy and, and theology. Um, and I came across a, kind of a description of of what's called the measurement problem in quantum theory, which is kind of the the central one of the central uh, sort of uh, metaphysical problems and philosophical problems in quantum theory. And just the description of that alone, alone, you know, the way it was worded uh, struck me uh, as sounding very much like a description of mimetic desire, of, of the problem of mimetic desire that that uh, that Gerard kind of tackled, namely this kind of um, uh, this uh, you know understanding desire as a kind of one-on-one -on -one relationship, this sort of linear relationship between a, a, a an object of desire and the person desiring it, and the way Gerard basically you know, restructured that into a triangular relationship. The description that I was reading of the measurement problem in physics uh, just sounded to me very much like that same uh, description, that same misunderstanding of desire. They, were, was, they seemed to be misunderstanding observation, the process of observation. The way, the way it was being described sounded very much like, like the usual way desire is described. And so it just occurred to me like, oh, that's interesting. You know, gee, I wonder... I wonder if we could kind of take that parallel further and uh, and just as kind of a fun intellectual exercise, I just sort of started building the analogy and started see seeing how far the analogy could go. And um, and it just kept on going. And after a while, it finally occurred to me that, you know, I think I'm actually onto something. I think this, I think there's really a, 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 a an actual connection here. It, it, it's not just an analogy. It's not just a, a parallel uh, with words. It's, uh, I think there might be a deep connection here. So yeah, that's that's kind of what what started that whole process, and and in fact, I I, I think I found that there is a very deep connection uh, between uh, the way mimetic theory approaches the problem of desire and the way we can approach the problem of of observation, of, uh, of observing the world around us, including the physical world around us. So the kind of uh, metaphysical problems that are popping up in quantum theory. Uh, which are causing the scientific community so much heartache, uh, I think can be can be understood uh, in a kind of more holistic sense uh, with the help of mimetic theory. And not just mimetic theory. Uh, Thomas Aquinas helps a lot too, uh, and a number of other philosophers uh, that I mentioned in the book uh, kind of shed some light on it. But it's really all kind of the glue that holds it all together is really mimetic theory. Can you expand on what's going on? I don't I don't know. Don't know uh, in, much about quantum theory, so yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I could talk about this stuff for hours. So <laughs> uh, the, the 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 challenge is being brief. Um, but uh, uh, I guess the key insight is that uh, in in science, uh, uh, it really in classical science as well as modern science, um, and quantum theory is kind of the the, the big you know, quantum theory and relativity theory are the big examples of modern science. Uh, there is this underlying assumption, which is really completely taken for granted, that observation, when, when one makes an observation or a measurement, it's basically a one-on-one -on -one relationship, this kind of linear relationship in the same sense that, that desire is often understood in a linear relationship. Um, you know, with, there's there's an object, a physical object, and it has certain observable features and observable quantities, and you make a measurement on it, uh, and you observe those those you know those those quantities. So there's a certain measurability, um, uh, in exactly the same way that that a, a person or an object can have a certain desirability, you know, or is understood as having an inherent desirability. We understand things as having an inherent observability. Um, well, when you kind of cling to that understanding of observation, uh, of how observation works, uh, it makes it very difficult to explain uh, some of the things that we are observing in, uh, in quantum mechanics. Uh, the, the kind of strange behavior that, that uh, it's not just theoretical, but that we're actually measuring in the laboratory. Um, it's very difficult to explain it in purely physical terms uh, with that kind of understanding, with that, uh, uh, you know, with, with, with that sort of linear uh, relationship in mind, and really, the the one of the, the main theses of my book is that 
it's because we're clinging to that sort of linear model of observation that we're having so much trouble. It's kind of locking us into a way of understanding the world and our relationship to the world, which is which is not allowing us to really come up with a convincing uh, explanation, a convincing physical model or metaphysical model of what we're measuring in the laboratory. Um, and so I simply asked the, the rather obvious question, well, Rene Girard basically solved this problem in the context of desire. You know, he, desire was understood in this linear way and Girard came along and said, no, actually, uh, what if it's not linear? What if it's actually triangular? That opens up a whole new dimension and, you know, uh, suddenly it's, you know, has this huge explanatory power. So I just thought to myself, okay, well, what's, what if we do the same thing with observation? What if observation is in fact not simply linear like this, but is a triangular relationship? Uh, does that help? What, 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 is, what does that do? And what I found is that, uh, yeah, not only helps, but it, uh, it explains a lot and it, it allows us to, to um, explain uh, the, the kind of uh, strange behavior that we're seeing um, in ways that are uh, consistent really with, uh, with scholastic philosophy, which is why I bring in Aquinas, um, with uh, theology, um, and, and it's all made possible with, uh, well, with mimetic theory. There's a key though, that uh, you have to understand the observer in quantum mechanics as, uh, as a human observer. And this is, a, this is a point of debate within the scientific community. Uh, the scientific community does not like to accord any kind of special status to a human being. You know, a measurement device is a measurement device. Whether you're human or whether you're a clock or whether you're a ruler, you know, shouldn't matter. You should be objective. And so, you know, objective science does not like to sort of uh, start uh, taking into account things like the subjective nature of human beings and, you know, what a person thinks or feels or anything. None of that is scientific. You know, that's psychology, you know, that's philosophy, but, you know, science is objective. Um, and there's, you know, there's a certain truth to that. Um, and yet, uh, I'm not the first person, I'm not the first physicist to, to note that uh, these strange problems in quantum theory really come up because, uh, because they really come up when you consider the observer as a, as a human being. That was kind of the beginning of the measurement problem. And uh, some physicists, uh, some of the great physicists have talked about the, the importance of consciousness. They, they kind of located the problem in consciousness. Uh, you know, it's not just measurement. It's not just when you measure a problem, but it's when a conscious observer measures things. That's, that's when you start seeing problems. Well, that's, that's problematic as well, and people have argued against that. Um, but I think, you know, you can try and kind of put the problem in consciousness. You can try and put it in observation in a, in a kind of more uh, materialistic sense. But I think as long as you can accept the fact that there's something unique about a human observer, uh, that there's a certain objectivity amongst all observations, um, but an objective human observation, which is still still an objective observation, but when a human being makes an objective observation, uh, that's different. And it's different primarily because unlike any other measurement device, a human being is mimetic. A human being is not just himself or herself. A human being is also, uh, in, in a sense, you know, the perspective of a human being is made up of the perspectives of other human beings as well. And if you take that sort of mimetic, inherently mimetic dimension into account, um, it kind of blows open a, a, a number of things in, the, in, in quantum mechanics and in, in the way we understand the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. So that's really the, that's, that's the impetus behind, behind the whole thing. You know, that, that leads to a lot of interesting uh, discussion analysis, but, but what I've, been pleasantly surprised at is that it leads to very consistent you know it, it, it doesn't lead to some interesting discussion and then you hit a wall where it just doesn't make any sense anymore it just keeps on making sense it's all very consistent let me ask you do you remember uh, maybe one or two comments or advice that Rene gave you when you talked to him at all did you ever talk discuss this with Rene uh no, I, I never had the chance to talk about uh, about my book or or my work on quantum mechanics with with Rene. Um, uh, I talked about you know other things about mimetic theory, uh, things that I've been reading at the time, and you know 
exchanged opinions. Um, but no, I never discussed my work with him. I certainly discussed my work a lot with my father. Absolutely. In fact, he was, he was critical along, along those lines. Um, so I almost feel like I got the perspective of Rene Girard. You know, I kind of know what Rene Girard would have said exactly. if I had talked to him. You know? Your father, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, but um, no, I, 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 I can't think of a, a time when, you know, when he would, when he gave me advice on my work specifically okay. or anything. You know? Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. You, you came in late in the game. So that, yeah, you, yeah, your... that, that's right. Right. And I was never really a student uh, in, in, you know, in the usual sense. I, I never took a class with Rene Gerard or anything like that. Right. So right. Like, it, it reminds me is this little anecdote at one of the cover conferences, the one in, uh, in California some years ago, there was a speaker uh, who was going to speak on Lebanon? He was a Jewish speaker. He was going to. He had he had a plenary talk, and he was supposed to speak on on Lebanon. But he changed at the last minute at, as a surprise to everyone, and started giving this huge critique on Gerard, on Rene Gerard. Uh, you know, he was new to Gerardian theory, and I guess he had just read some stuff kind of right before the conference to get up to speed a little bit on it, so he could relate it to to Lebanon a little. And I guess he was kind of taken aback by the whole thing and. Instead of talking about Levinas, he basically just went on his diatribe for about 45 minutes, criticizing mimetic theory and Girardian theory. And, uh, and his big critique was, you know, I remember him saying, you know, in the middle of this, of this rant of his, uh, which really kind of annoyed everybody at the time, he said, you know, this is, to, to Nietzscheans, everything is will to power, and to Girardians, everything is mimetic desire. You know? <laughs> and I remember hearing, you know, he said this, and I remember thinking, Gosh, you know, it logically that that's a valid point. You know, it's a valid concern. You know, just like everyone else, just like everyone that's a Nietzsche fan thinks everything is built upon. It, it's true. This mimetic theory has this kind of broad explanatory power, and it's easy to for it to you know to kind of fall into this 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 fallacy of uh, well, I can explain everything with mimetic theory. You know, just just give me enough time, and I'll figure out how to explain with mimetic theory. You know, that makes it sound bad. But the contrast between Nietzsche and Girard. Is so stark, you know, for, for him to make precisely that comparison, comparing Gerard to Nietzsche, I thought, my gosh, you, you just couldn't have a, 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 a starker contrast than that. You know, for you to make your point that uh, Gerard is just like Nietzsche, Gerardians are just like Nietzscheans. Right. Okay, M maybe Gerardians are like Nietzscheans, but Gerard is nothing like Nietzsche. Right. Gerard is the opposite of Nietzsche, right. you know? Uh, just what what a difference! And I remember when he said that, I was kind of like, all right, I'm just going to write this guy off because that contrast alone tells me how off base he is. You know, yeah. there is no comparison right. between between Gerard and Nietzsche. Yeah, no. So I don't. Know. Yeah, that that's that's the kind of that that's part of the power of uh, of mimetic theory. That that kind of intuitive power I was talking about before. You know, he's just he's just such a he's just such a good person and everything just comes from a place of honesty of intellectual honesty you know that uh, you don't find in too many other places your father when i was interviewing him he he mentioned that uh, your work has some implications uh, that can be applied to the resurrection of christ yeah that's um that is a i kind of end my book with a specifically theological uh, implication or application of uh, of what I call triangular observation, obviously analogous to triangular desire. Um, I don't know if you want me to delve into it now, though. I'd have to. <laughs> the book kind of leads up to that. Uh, in, up is to it, that. Final is it chapter. difficult to talk about it, or uh, no, not not difficult. I mean, I'm. I, I how much time? <laughs> uh, Go ahead to, to get to that point. Um, I'll see if I can, uh, uh, if I can maybe get there quickly. The problem I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with in quantum mechanics and, and bringing mimetic theory is, uh, like I said, this, this problem of, of observation. And um, the problem of, of, uh, of observing, in a sense, uh, more than one thing at the same time. Uh, this, is, this is really, the, this is the, the measurement problem, the heart of the measurement problem in quantum theory. Quantum theory says really uh, that when you're not looking at something, when you're not observing it, it exists in a kind of ontological limbo. 
it exists in what's called a superposition state, uh, which is defined by the what's called a wave function. So, you know, we're used to thinking of of some object in in space, some 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 object in nature, um, existing in a certain spot. You know, this this thing, this particle, this ball, whatever it is, exists here. You know, not there, not there, but here. You know, you can point to it. But when you get down to the quantum level, that is the uh, the subatomic level, and and uh, and uh, you know, down to the, the level of very small things that are very difficult to measure. Um, it turns out that nature doesn't doesn't actually act that way. Nature uh, has this inherent uncertainty, which uh, which has been quantified by by Werner Heisenberg. So now it's the, it's called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, uh, which is uh, at the heart of quantum theory, uh, and it says that at the heart of nature is this inherent uncertainty, this, this kind of unknowability in nature, you know, a point that you simply can't get beyond. You can know where something is up to a point, but beyond that, you don't know where it is. Um, and in fact, there's a trade-off between uh, position and momentum, uh, another trade-off between energy and time. There, there are a few different relationships where the more you know about one, the less you know about the other, you know, but you can't know about everything. Um, this leads to a, a model, a physical model of the universe in which uh, everything exists in this kind of ontological limbo. Like I said, everything exists in sort of multiple states at the same time, multiple physical states at the same time. And it's only when you observe something, when you actually look and, and make, take a measurement that, the nat that nature suddenly collapses and it's called the collapse, the collapse of the wave function where it exists in, in you know, many different possible states or probable, probable states. And as soon as you make a measurement, nature collapses down to a single state, which must be true because we don't observe anything in multiple states. We can't, it's impossible. You know, you can't see something there and there at the same time. You can only see something there. So when you measure it and you measure it there, that means that nature physically collapsed onto there. You know, which is sounds absurd and ridiculous. And in fact, this was brought up by Schrodinger in the first place as a kind of thought experiment, precisely to demonstrate how ridiculous this 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 notion of uh, probabilistic uh, quantum mechanics is. You know, that this understanding of the universe in this way. Schrodinger was the first one to say, oh, "This is just stupid." I mean, if if that's the way the world works, then look look how crazy this is. You know, the world must suddenly collapse. I mean, how stupid is that? Well, that is how, in fact, we understand the world nowadays. That is, that is a fundamental part of quantum mechanics is the collapse of the wave function. Um, and we don't have a very good uh, physical explanation for this, you know, or metaphysical explanation for this. Uh, and, and the scientific community is, 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 has tried and has come up with a number of very clever theories and ways to try and explain it, but, uh, but they're not very convincing. They're mathematically consistent, which is really the only reason why scientists take it seriously at all. Uh, but philosophically and metaphysically, I mean, it's weird. It's just weird. Um, and there have been a number of, of interpretations of quantum mechanics to try and get around this, this idea, this problem. Um, and each one tends to be even weirder than the last. Uh, but as long as they're mathematically consistent, you know, they're taken seriously to some degree, but, but nobody feels comfortable with. Um, so anyway, what we end up with is this this uh, apparently the, the, this world in which um, something can exist uh, as itself, but in more than one way, in more than one state at the same time. You know, it, uh, it, it exists as itself. In fact, its, its selfness is defined by its being here and here and here, or being in multiple states at the same time. That is the state of that, of that object in, the, in, in nature. And it's only when you measure it that you have this sort of magical effect on it and it collapses onto one thing. Um, and what it collapses to by is completely ar arbitrary. I mean, it, it's not like you push it in one direction or another. It's simply the fact that you measure it depending on the probabilities. You know, if, if it has a 50% chance of being this and a 50% chance of being that, when you measure it, it could be this or that. And if you measure it again, it could be the other thing. You know, it's, it's purely probabilistic. It's purely chance. Um, but this object exists in these kind of multiple states at the same time. Um, so what I did, uh, you know, I, 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 in my book, I kind of explain uh, how this can be understood 
uh, by using mimetic theory um, and, uh, and Thomistic theory kind of together. But in the end, I, I try to apply this idea to, uh, to the, um, the post-resurrection uh, um, uh, observances of, of Christ. Uh, you know, th this, there's a few examples in the scriptures that talk about uh, Christ uh, after he was crucified, um, being observed by his disciples and his disciples not recognizing him. Right? Uh, so the first one was in the tomb. Mary sees him in the tomb and doesn't recognize him. Later, it's on the road to Emmaus, uh, where, uh, where the disciples see him, but they don't recognize him. And in fact, they walk along and spend time talking with him, and they still don't recognize him. Um, and there's, uh, there's another example, too, where he's on the, uh, on the sea, sea of Tiberias, I guess, and, uh, and, the, and they don't recognize him there either. Um, so there's this, these few examples in, the, in, the, in, the, um, in, in Scripture that talk about this, this weird phenomenon, and it's not explained at all in any way. It's just kind of mentioned almost in passing. Uh, you know, the disciples didn't recognize him. I mean, why on earth not? Why wouldn't, why wouldn't they recognize him, you know? And I've heard some weird explanations for this. I, I heard one homily where the priest was saying, well, they were walking towards the West and the sun was setting. So the sun was in their eyes. So they didn't recognize Jesus at first. I'm, I'm not sure that's what the gospel was trying to get, for, <laughs> you know? So I kind of analyze that situation uh, in terms of um, the relationship that Jesus has with the physical world around him, Jesus has with, with nature. Um, uh, and kind of a, a, a big, at, at the heart, you know, one of the, the, the central conclusions of, of my book is that uh, our relationship to each other mimetically, our, our mimetic relationship to each other and our mimetic relationship to God affects our physical relationship with, with nature, with the world around us. That those two things, I mean, quantum theory already basically says that our relationship to nature is a function of, of, of ourselves, of our, of our observation, of our measurement, that we, we have an influence on nature in a sense, just by virtue of being a measurement device. So when we, when we measure nature, we, we interact with nature, but, but not just in the usual way, we, we, we change it. We make nature become this or that, you know, un, until we get involved, nature is both this and that. And it takes, I think a human being, it takes an observer, and I would say a human observer to make this and that turn into either this or that, to make nature become one thing or another. So quantum theory already suggests that we basically participate in a kind of process of, uh, of creation in, in uh, you know, scientists would say a process of measurement or observation, but really in a metaphysical sense, it's a process of creation. And uh, the point in my book is that uh, that relationship with nature is really a function of our mimetic relationships with each other. That those two things are, are in, in fact, that uncertainty in nature is not really an uncertainty in nature. It's really a reflection of our own uncertainty, our own mimetic uncertainty. That uncertainty that Heisenberg was talking about, my claim is that it's not really an inherent uncertainty in nature. It's an uncertainty which is which is really the natural contingency of our mimetic relationships. So it's it's a reflection of our mimetic relationships. Now, it comes about because of our of our mimetic relationships with each other, with the mob around us. That's where the uncertainty comes from. And the, the more mimetic, the more rivalistic those relationships, uh, the more confusing things get, the more my observation gets lost in everyone else's observations and that uncertainty grows. And, and by uncertainty, I mean quite mathematically quantum mechanical un uncertainty. And so our relationship to nature grows and our observation of nature uh, changes. If instead of, uh, so that's our, uh, our mimetic relationships with, with, uh, with each other. Our mimetic relationship with God is, is quite different in that it's not a relationship with the mob. That is really uh, purely a relationship of, of love between us and God. Now, of course, you, know, you, you can mess that up, right? You, you can, uh, you know, you, a person's relationship can, with God can be very complicated, but it's complicated because of that person's relationship with other people and with the world around them. As far as God is concerned, you know, there's, there is a, there, there's an identity, there's a, there's a single truth, right? 
your understanding of the truth may be confused. Your understanding of nature may be confused, but God is not confused, right? And so if your model, if your one and only model is God, then there's really no room for uncertainty. Our models are each other. We have lots of models all over the place. So there's lots of uncertainty and that affects our measurements on nature and our relationship with nature. But if our model were nothing but God and we only had that one model, there would be no uncertainty at all. All that uncertainty would disappear and our relationship with nature would change accordingly. Well, that was the case with Jesus. Jesus' one model was the father, God. That was a, a kind of perfectly uh, mimetic relationship, absolutely devoid of rivalry, um, but 100% mimetic uh, to the point of, uh, of being consubstantial, right? One in being with the father. Um, so it doesn't get any more mimetic than that, right? Uh, so that means, I suggest, that Jesus' relationship with nature was also very different than our relationship with nature. And so the first people to observe Christ um, in this new relationship with the Father post-resurrection would have observed something different. You know, their, their, basically their observation of reality would have been shifted. You know, they're, not, they're, obs they're still observing Jesus, but it's now a Jesus that they don't quite recognize. And eventually, of course, they do recognize as Jesus kind of talks to them and opens their eyes, you know, uh, they, they kind of get it. But they need, they need help in recognizing something like that, right? And this is true of all of us to some degree. We all have a relationship with God as well as with each other. So we're not completely devoid of the truth. Right? So it, it doesn't seem like a big stretch to me to say that, well, he's, he's difficult to recognize, but not completely difficult to recognize. No, I think that's perfectly natural. You know, we all can recognize God to some degree, you know, but only Jesus recognizes God fully. And so if we recognize Jesus fully, that takes, that takes some effort. That's, that's not something we're used to seeing, right? That's something that Jesus kind of has to point out to us and, and guide us along, which I think is exactly what happened. So that's, that's, uh, that's kind of my final application of this mimetic observation, uh, you know, which relates our mimetic relationships to our relationship with nature. That's, that's amazing. How long have you been working on it? Oh, years and years. I, I think I presented the first idea of this at the cover conference in London, which is, I don't know, 15 years ago or something. Uh, it, was a, it was a while ago. It's gone through a number of, uh, of transformations. Uh, in fact, uh, I thought I had the book pretty much done, and then I ended up rewriting most of it uh, because I, I kind of realized that I was uh, going down the wrong path a little bit. Um, and that was, that, was, that was really my own fault. I had a number of people uh, review kind of the first versions of my book and the responses I was getting back were surprising to me that they, they simply weren't, they weren't seeing the, uh, the implications of, of, of my work, which annoyed me at first, you know, but, uh, but then I came to realize it's fault. I, I was very deliberately trying to be scientific and uh, trying to sort of filter out the theological implications and the philosophy because I knew that was going to be distasteful to the scientific community. And so I was trying to make it really a scientific theory. Uh, and then, you know, when people kind of read it and, you know, kind of said, I, I, don't, I don't really see where you're going with this. I don't see why this is such a big deal. I wanted to say, how can you not see the, the, the implications of this? You know? <laughs> and then I realized it's the theological implications and the medic implications. Yeah, okay, I can see why you wouldn't get that because I've been deliberately avoiding that. Okay, maybe. So I, I kind of changed tacks and, and I became a little bit more explicit in, in what I was really trying to say, which made it a, a better book, I think. In a way. I was toying with the idea of adding another chapter on, on prayer uh, because I, I think there are some significant implications on the, on the nature of prayer. And, um, and quantum mechanics, uh, quantum uh, physics? Uh, 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 yes, th this relationship, the same way that, um, you know, if there's a connection between uh, how we relate to each other and how we relate to God and, and the physical world around us, uh, if you think of prayer as something that, you know, prayer is by definition a, a communication with God, and it's supposed to affect the world around us, there's a direct uh, connection there. Um, and uh, I was going to write a chapter on that, but... Um, I thought maybe that was going a little bit too far. I didn't, I didn't want to, you know, a, a study of prayer really is a very deeply theological thing. 
I felt kind of unqualified to do that. And, and I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to bite off too much, you know, more than I could chew and, and kind of end the, uh, the book on something that, you know, I, maybe I should just, you know, relax and, and let, uh, let better theologians than me kind of tackle that one. But, but, but the implications are there. What is the book called? Uh, it's called Reflection in the Waves. Uh, it refers to the wave function of quantum mechanics. It's a bit of a pun. The, the reflection in the waves is meant to indicate that when we observe the wave function, we're really seeing a reflection of our own mimetic relationships and our own humanity. Yeah. What's your favorite book of René's? Um, I guess it would probably be The Scapegoat, I think. Really? Yeah, uh, I just love the way it's laid out. Maybe it's because that was also one of the first books I read and it was just so clear and uh, so well laid out. Um, I really appreciated that. <laughs> it just it just made a lot of sense, you know, the kind of the application of of, uh, of mimetic theory, mimetic desire to, to that. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I remember enjoying that. Um, Things Hidden was, was, you know, Definitely a book to kind of delve into and, uh, uh, you know, think made you think a lot. Um, his last book with Battling to the End. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, that was a weird book. Honestly, that, I couldn't finish that book. I, I got about two thirds of the way through it. That's the only book of Gerard's that I just, I, I, I actually put it down. You know, uh, I got, yeah, maybe about two thirds of the way through it. And I just thought this is, this isn't the Gerard I know. This is weird. And, uh, and I think a lot of people felt that way. But I think just as far as kind of a, the most enjoyable read, I think uh, maybe one of the more influential is probably Scapegoat. How did you manage to get through things hidden coming from physics? Oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm actually more interested in this uh, in literature and philosophy and mimetic stuff than I am in physics. Don't tell my boss that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I would rather spend my time on that stuff. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for taking time to do this conversation. Really appreciate it.